could you not move to that in the morning? Because, huh? because it's still the morning and I'm barely awake. <laughs> no. <clears throat> I have to say that that new music with that countdown melody that you entered there, this is our this is our production wizard over there. So <laughs> yeah, nice. Welcome everybody to chats, many culture. Buongiorno, Brett. Come stai? Yeah, buongiorno, buongiorno. It is a wonderful day, wonderful Friday. It is uh, the end of a, what has been, I think. I mean, of all, you know, all the one, all the weeks that we've done. I mean, every week, all the week, many right? weeks we've done, the many weeks, the years of toil, and <laughs> um, the this week has been fantastic. Uh, we have we have had the m most amazing guests uh, talking about art, and I'm glad we picked this topic. Uh, obviously, it's close in many ways to both our hearts, but it has been really impactful um, to listen to the. Uh, the insights and the experiences of how people are using art in their culture and across cultures. It's been fantastic. I don't know about you. I've, I've been loving it because the insights that came out of our guests were a very profound and went beyond what one might expect when we set up this program as talking about culture, the, the space where there's never enough culture. Um, Yes, art is one of those aspects of culture that lots of people that are not doing our work would think of first. However, the making the connection, closing that loop, that working creatively in an artful process, creating art of some sort, is a conduit, a tool, a metaphor, a vehicle to do our work. And that was quite inspiring and enlightening. I, I'm with you, brother. Yeah, but it hasn't ended here. I mean, no. you're not putting up with us today. We also have another wonderful friend of ours, another special guest who we're going to bring on here, who's going to round out this week in probably the the best way we possibly can, talking about, uh, well, talking about visual arts, but also talking about food. And it's the weekend and it's a time, usually time when people get together and share food. And may we please introduce uh, the wonderful and Timo Chimino, buongiorno. Buongiorno. <laughs> so Ciao. Ready, guys. I'm the last one of the series, right? It's like, wow. <laughs> well, last but not least, the most important, the most, no. You, you're good in your own right. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Timo. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. Yeah. So. so tell the people who don't know you yet, because the three of us, we've worked together, but not everybody watching will probably know this. So Antimo Cimino, that is Italian. And yeah. you're not you're not in Italy, you're on the West Coast. It's no, early sadly, morning. I'm not in Italy. I my heart is there, especially now, but I am in Portland, Oregon. And I have been here about 25 years. Can you believe that? <laughs> so you, you yeah. came here as a child, basically. Not really. Um, <laughs> I'm 48. Uh, I can say that I lived more in the U.S. than I lived in Italy, where I was born and where in my entire family is. Uh, but I get to go a lot there when under normal circumstances we can move about the planet. And I take amazing clients and groups uh, throughout Italy, in and out of my friends and family circle, uh, in a way that uh, keeps them in touch more with uh, the people of the culture, not so much uh, the arts and, um, you know, the folklore part of uh, Italy. I think that uh, when one travels to another culture, human interaction is uh, the most important factor. If you want to understand how these people work, how they think, their heartbeat, right? And so mm -hmm. entering their home and entering their lifestyle is a very, very unique uh, experience. I think that that's great. You you um you said folklore, right? And so when we travel to places, we um, we absorb the folklore of a place before we go. We build up a yeah. certain story in our head about what this is going yeah. to be. Yeah. And uh, as somebody who visited, so let's bring in, of course, at your home country of Italy last year when I spent three weeks there. Of course, I had never been to Italy. Um, our mode of traveling with our family is to try and do what you do. 
mm -hmm. um, what you talk about. But still, we we are still confronted by a lot of content that we prepare yeah. ourselves for, and we look at this the folkloric part of the of yeah. countryside. But it is it is those special moments that we sometimes miss just with the people. Yeah, that that when all that goes away, and I, I think your idea of the experiential travel should be something that everybody tries to uh, uh, get themselves uh, involved with. Um, uh, you certainly have to see the sites, and you have to do those tourist oh, things. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, there is no. I mean, it, for me, uh, it's the the beauty is blending the tourist things with the traveler in depth off the beaten path uh, as well. And there is a, a huge difference uh, uh, between doing that on your own and doing it with somebody that facilitates the entire interaction. Mm -hmm. And I think the uniqueness, and I've seen it over and over with mm -hmm. my clients, is that I have one foot in the American culture and one foot in the Italian culture. I can really um, facilitate a, a lot of intercultural dialogue, a lot of uh, aha moments and amazing memories that uh, come from connecting authentically with people mm. and um yeah it's just uh, the ultimate i think that's uh, that's a given i think yeah. you're raising an important point you, you two because the the folklore part of the sightseeing or the uh, checking off the the travelers right. checklist then done this done yeah. that got the t-shirt got the picture <laughs> held my hand against the leaning tower and and what, what not so <laughs> It's hard to take that away from people because for some people that is essential for their experience. Yeah. However, I think in my experience, if you if you truly connect with the locals, with the people who live in that land, and allow them to take your hand and guide you to the sites and let them give you some local context around what you're experiencing as you hold up the leaning tower with your hand in the picture. They, they will tell you a story about it that no tour guide will give you because they don't necessarily live there or it's not written like that in the book because it's their unique story. Yeah. And and it becomes, it becomes yours, it becomes your unique memory because you sat down with these people had a drink you sat down yeah. with them to eat maybe you they taught you how to cook that meal together yeah. so it yeah. becomes a whole body they, experience yeah, rather than a snapshot instagram yeah the the idea for me is that the local with their humility uh with their pride of having an american in their home are going to touch you at a level that you cannot even anticipate. Mm. I often don't even know what's going to happen. Um, the, I've been uh, to visiting friends and family where all of a sudden somebody knocks at the door and it's the neighbor. And all of a sudden we are going to her house because she wants to show you her house. She's never had an American in her house. You know, things like that, that become this, uh, oh my God, what's going on? I never expected mm. this to happen. You mm -hmm. can't expect something that, uh, uh, emotional to happen while standing in line waiting to get into the Uffizi or going to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa or entering in the Colosseum. Right. And you actually, what happens is you may end up interacting with other tourists from around the world and many other Americans, for instance, uh, on a line uh, waiting for half an hour to go into places. It's a different experience. And I'm not saying that uh, the first one of going to the touristy things and the museums is wrong. By all means, it's part of an experience, but blend it, blend it so that you can go from uh, being a tourist to a traveler and, and going deeper in your experience. My, my favorite um, guideline around this is a quote that is ascribed to Anthony Bourdain, the late, the late chef and, and travel journalist who apparently said, don't go and drink at the hotel. Find out where the people who... Mm -hmm the hotel do yeah. their eating and drinking and go yeah. there yeah absolutely. That's, that, that, that's my guideline yeah. yeah now you don't only do these transatlantic connections and these human you don't only facilitate human connection by experimental travel you also use art in your process antimo so i think we're looking at some of your art if i'm not yeah mistaken. yeah this is one of my pieces that I actually did during this uh, pandemic um, you know, I realized that in terms of art expression, from mm -hmm. the cooking to the painting, 
Uh, it has been the most prolific time of my life. And uh, I had to sort of stop and reflect what made me so prolific. And uh, it was really sort of a going to a place of escape, going to a place where I could find a relief from the heavy situation that we were living in and mm -hmm. following the racial tension, you know, it became even more heavy on the heart. And for me, um, I needed to do self-care. I needed to shut off. I needed to close the, the computer, close the news and go downstairs and paint. My garage became a nice clean floor garage to paint splattered everywhere because I was painting with my hands. I was painting with the, all kinds of balloons and I was exploding balloons on the canvas. And uh, I was just like uh, wanting to completely be hijacked, hijacked into a different planet. And for me, Art was like um, easy uh, hijack, easy meditation. Um, it was a, a relief. It was, um, for me, it was probably a repository of emotions and feelings that I couldn't uh, partake in, in and share with anybody. Mm. And then another interesting one that uh, um, was also very emotional to me was my, back in May, in, uh, May uh, sorry, in March and April, in two May, Italy was experiencing the worst of the pandemic. Uh, we all know it, we all seen it. Um, and uh, it became very heavy and difficult to um, think of my parents in the South. Um, my mom, very emotional about, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna see you this year, or this and that, very negative thinking. And so I studied uh, uh, FaceTiming with her every single day to the point where we made bread on Facebook I made a cake for her birthday on Facebook. You know, I was just like cooking with her, just like when I was a kid in the mm. kitchen with her and my grandma. Mm. And so food is an art. If Food is not just mere nutrition. And for Italian, I think in particular, uh, maybe other European uh, countries uh, as well. We, in Italy, there is a saying, when uh, you are eating, we say, anche l'occhio vuole la sua parte. And that translates for the eye as well sort of needs to eat, needs mm -hmm. to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about uh, the passion that goes into food, there is a pride in creating the dish that uh, captures your attention, that says, eat me, eat me, right? This is and funny because we have, we, we have that same, we have that similar saying in, in German. Um, das Auge ist mit, so the, the eye sits with you at the table and is eating along, right? Yep. So th this is, and we, we may have to underscore this a little bit because many of our viewers are in North America where w what you just described is a foreign concept for many, that food can be more than um, uh, nourishment and more, more than calorie consumption in order to keep our bodies functioning. It's not, it's not just fuel for the body. It is, it can be a holistic experience that transcends, transcends the, the mere eating well, process, right? I'll tell you more. I think this pandemic, while it's been a disaster at many levels, it has been probably the best teaching moment uh, of everybody's life. Mm. And when I look at the American lifestyle of being always in a hurry, from home to work, from work to picking up the kids, to taking the kids to soccer, all of this chaotic, high-stress uh, activity that we are accustomed to, we call that normal. Well, think about how we had to all be inside for at least there were two, three weeks where we couldn't really go anywhere. Everything was closed, no cars in the streets. Families resoluted to cooking together. Hmm. Family resoluted to eat at the table together because there was this uh, breakdown and craving of human contact. Well, what do I do now? I can't order takeout. I can't go to the restaurant. And you fa finally go to the basic of human beings survival mode, right? And so hopefully we've learned something. Hopefully we'll, we've learned the pleasure of cooking, the pleasure of being in touch with the food that we eat. And rather than, uh, hello, I'm coming to pick up pizza in half an hour. Um, you know, so, um, and to me, I looked it with the lens of, you know, the Italian who, um, Still today, I swear, in 25 years of living here, I don't think I have not cooked more than 15 times. Not cooked. 
Mm. I cook every single day. Even when I had a corporate job, I would cook in the evening my meal for lunch. And my colleagues always were like, oh, my God, your food looks amazing. It's like, yeah, I made it, right? <laughs> so it becomes this part of your lifestyle. And for us Italians, the food is um, such a, a connector. It is a, the tapestry of our culture is also based on food because we prepare it and, see, and we eat seasonally, especially in the South. We have so many produce and the, and the weather is so different that uh, we eat with the seasons. Mm -hmm. We don't eat strawberries at Christmas because there is no strawberries to find and unless you import them, but nobody thinks that way, right? And so getting around the table and, and eating and, and cooking together becomes this bonding process. Uh, I remember when I was a kid that uh, every week my, my parents had their friends uh, move, uh, go from one house to the other. Of course, it was a, a little bit of a macho culture and you'd see all the ladies coming into that person's kitchen for two, three, two, three hours before cooking a storm while the men were probably still going at the bar or uh, in the piazza or elsewhere. And then they showed up and he was ready to eat and we would play games and things. And I was always with the ladies <laughs> cooking because that was what drove me, right? And so anyway, it's just um, part of our fabric. That's all I could say. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something that's completely not politically correct or, or probably every Italian will crucify me for this, but the, nas the national colors, the flags of the Italian flag, tomatoes, mozzarella, basil. It's right there. I mean, you, you, made, you, you, made, you made Caprese your flag. Uh, so. that, 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 that's wonderful. I like the, the, I remember even in Australia that we measured seasons by the availability of certain foods. Mm -hmm. And that, right. that's kind of gone away. I mean, uh, I think that that was, I mean, we, I, I grew up in a place that really didn't have much variations in weather across, uh, you know, it got a little bit cooler in the wintertime. Yeah. Now I live in Chicago where the variation <laughs> yeah. is I'm glad got the seasons because I don't have the measurement of life of uh, perhaps uh, the, the, the food of like looking forward to the strawberry season or looking forward to the... Yeah. You know, to and the and there is something to that, right? You, yeah. The looking forward to a produce, I still have it. Like right now, what I'm craving is the figs, right? Because I know they're... So your body grows with the seasons and you are... Uh, anticipating certain flavors and it's all a game without with your emotions of anticipation and then the the craving and then you finally get it um and if you didn't grow up like that you wouldn't possibly understand what this feeling is like um, well let, let me i'm gonna that's a good point i'm gonna sorry to interrupt you but i want to show a, a short clip of antimo in action in uh, in his home country this is this kind of shows this emotion you, you just can't help but feel it here just enjoy this in the entire town and when they're baked in this wood burning oven it's like heaven and earth opening up this is biscotti from Puglia, Manduria and this is Antimo from Globally Loco <laughs> Dang it! Those the, those were the figs. Oh man, <laughs> they're the figs, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Then click add extension. To oh yeah. What is going on? S Siri's talking to you. She, yeah. she she came she came back from yesterday. Well, I think you see me. I don't. I no longer see you. I see some sort of update needed, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, we see, we see you, Antimo. Oh great. Yeah. So when when. <laughs> When you describe cooking and and the preparation of food as this transcendental experience or this this cultural experience that helps us, or even an, an artistic process because it, it serves more than just our our need for for replenishment, how would you describe your your artistic process of painting or or creating art in terms of your work? So I know you are part of a group that is hosting a retreat there in, in Oregon yeah. and, and you use art as part of that process, don't you? 
So uh, I do. Uh, I'm going to go there in a second because sure. uh, I was watching my mom in that video with my aunt making cookies. Um, I remember one thing that I want to share with you. This um, makes me almost emotional. When I, I go home, and especially, for instance, uh, when I will have to go again uh, soon, hopefully, and it will have been a year or a year and a half since I haven't been home, uh, but this happens even when I haven't been home for three months. My mom will ask me before she, she even, when I get there, before I get there and when I get there, the conversation is not about, oh, how are you? You know, sure, she hugs you and all of that. But the first one thing that she says is, what do you want to eat? What are you craving? What, what, what can I make you? Uh, I have this, I have that, you know, I know you like this. So as you can see, even at that, that level of a mother love uh, for the son and, and it's fulfilling her sense of motherhood goes to food. Mm. And so it is extremely important. It is, uh, I go back to say, this is not just taking food and putting it in your mouth for nourishment. It, think about every bite with the, the passion and the love and the caring that is being made and food will taste different. Think of uh, the passion that goes and the energy that goes into food when you cook it and food will taste different. So that's, that's huge for me. But going back to your question. So yeah, I do uh, all sorts of other things. All of them are connected to passion. But I realized that uh, art has been a omnipresent thing in my life. Um, at 14 until 21 years old, I was a dancer and that was for me um, an escape from uh, um, a kind of a strong father who did, did not like me to dance. Mm. Um, everything was like a, a rebellion, um, a, a putting my emotions in, in some way so that I could express them rather than have them sit inside of me. So I look at the creative process as a outlet of expression. Uh, it's sure it's meditative, um, but there's more to it when you think about how your brain needs to disconnect from this um, hyper tense way of living on it on an every day, every minute of our life. And then you try to shut it off and go into this area that, as I said before, kind of uh, hijacks your mind and puts you in a place of uh, creative response. So I think uh, uh, art is a creative response, a creative process a creative processing of feelings and emotions. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I did it a lot during the COVID pandemic and the racial tension because um, I was feeling I, need, I wanted to express something uh, and I was fearful of expressing something. Um, I actually never did stand in front of a camera and express things like uh, Christian, like you did, or Brett, you did as well. Um, but I put it into paintings. Um, I didn't have, I didn't need the world to listen because I knew deep inside me where I was and um, I just needed to put it somehow, somewhere. I created a play, a, a, a painting during, um, uh, after, during the week after George Floyd was um, assassinated. Um, and um, I started with, uh, Actually, I have the painting with me right here, and I'm going to take it so that I can describe it live. Yeah, that, that is awesome. See, the, these are the moments you don't calculate for people walking away from the camera to pick something okay, up. I know you can see it. I can't. There you go. You can see it. Oh, okay, wow. so what I did, I took a, a, an old canvas that was a beat up, even torn, and I put a tape in the back. I wanted something that said... Um, uh, used, uh, abused. I wanted something that was uh, thick in skin, in history. And um, I used to, there was a writing over it that said garage sale. I just uh, plastered it with gesso and started uh, trying to get rid of it because it was going to show through. And then I started with this thick coat of paint uh, at the top, as you can see, black. And then across it, I started putting blotches of color, one next to the other, one next to the other. And I took a, um, a, a brush and I drew it vertically through all of the colors and created hearts. I've documented this in pictures. And that spoke to me because it was a hearts of many colors, bleeding, um, crying for, 
for love, compassion, understanding, justice. And then I thought, this, you know, I, I was in tears doing this. I was in tears. I, I have not been able to watch the video of George Floyd. I will not watch it because it tears me apart. Uh, to think that a human being can be capable of such an atrocity. And so through that, I was literally crying and sobbing, and I thought, tears. So I took the canvas and flipped it um, like this, and, uh, and the color, because I was, I was working on the floor, and the color started dripping into tears. Um, I let it dry. I went back the following day. Everything was still going on and very, very heightened and, and very heavy emotionally. I drew another um, uh, set of color, uh, blood and, and deep, uh, deep uh, pur purple kind of thing, and let it dry, uh, drop that into a pool that was the heart because we needed to manifest our heart, our heart taking, our heart loving, our heart of compassion. Um, and then I just ended it by splattering red uh, as if um, um, that was, you know, the violence that we've seen over and over and over and over uh, in the last uh, 400 years. And um, this is uh, Black Life Matters for me. And there, there's a connection you made, and I don't know if you made it consciously or if, if it was by accident, but you said earlier when you, when you enter your mom's home, the first thing she's asking you, what do you want to eat? And the last thing that George Floyd said with his last breath, he was calling out for his mom. Yeah. Yeah, it says it all, right? Yeah. I, anyway, I don't want to go other places, but these are the places where we sit, our emotions sit, and um, we have to listen. We have to talk about it. We have to stand up for it. Well, and you don't let them sit. You let you 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 allow them to come on canvas. You, that's your form of expression, right? And this is, you tell a story around this, and you can use this process and processing of emotions right. as as a vehicle to for your work, can't you? Yeah, um, I, I do. I, I actually, in everything that we do, especially right now, we're doing this uh, series of uh, wellness uh, leadership and wellness uh, retreats to uh, really uh, create a space where people can uh, unplug, can disconnect, can dedicate one full day to self-care, uh, to teach them how in even the highest of stress, you can turn off everything. You have a tool at your disposal and that is breath. Mm -hmm. It is underutilized, is misunderstood. We just breathe barely enough to survive just like we're doing now as we teach as we talk but there is a huge power to taking a deep slow breath from your nose holding into in opening your heart and expressing gratitude and let, letting go through the nose again very very slowly twice as slow as your intake of air and um, through this uh, series of exercises through exercises of laughter through exercises of thinking about your attention through a narrative of uh, uh, about your goals, about how to how to rewrite your life, um, we create this um, um, clinic of uh, self care where people come out of it and they are very very thankful they participate. They feel like they have tools to persist and endure during these uncertain circumstances. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, art is part of it because we also move, we feel the body, we, um, um, we dance um, just loosely. Uh, and, and I also say to people, truly, this is an opportunity to be foolish and to be a child mm. because oftentimes we forget to relax, to let it rise to the surface, what uh, emotions and what is that we're feeling, what... Uh, what do you feel when you channel the child in you? Mm. Um, so we forget how to be that, right? So if people go to this website that you're that you're seeing on the screen, culturalgloballabs.com, they'll find more information about how these retreats are put together and when um, how they can participate, uh, right? Somewhat they will, because one of our program is the wellness and leadership that we hopefully we can start again soon face to face when we can travel. 
but they can also email me at antimo at culturalgloballabs.com and I will give them information. Of course, uh, uh, for anybody living in Oregon and Washington, that is very feasible because these are face-to-face -face meetings. Um, it's a one hour, it's super safe. We are actually in the uh, curve and the bank of a river in a constant flow of air and water. Uh, we have about um, 12 uh, feet apart from one another and people can use masks as they wish and they felt extremely safe. They bring their own food, so there is nothing touching uh, somebody else's. So it's really a, a wonderful opportunity if you're in Oregon and in Washington. And it's coming up. The next one is on the 29th of August. But uh, otherwise, even online, um, we'll be happy to put together a workshop. And we will be launching soon a series of them anyway. All right. You see Antimo's email on the screen. So feel free to note it down and get in touch with the man. Beautiful. Un, un, ragazzo, un, un ragazzo bellissimo. <laughs> uh, it was Man. wonderful thank you thank you so thank much you. Uh, it, was it, was a, it was a perfect perfect icing on the cake <laughs> to uh bring a food metaphor uh to this wonderful week of art we uh we encourage everybody to uh watch not only this one but uh the other episodes this week uh in the past uh five days it's been wonderful thank you so much entomo for helping us round this week out. And uh, I think it's actually a topic we need to extend into into more more weeks, but um, we'll do that maybe in the future. Awesome. How, do you, how do you say have a wonderful weekend in Italian? Uh, have a wonderful week or weekend? Weekend. Uh, vi auguro un buon weekend o fine settimana? Fine settimana. Eh, mi settimana, eh. Gra <laughs> Grazie Ciao. mille. Grazie. Grazie, Bye, everybody. Ciao.